Hello, everyone, and welcome to ACS Webinars, connecting you with the best and brightest minds in chemistry and other sciences, live from Washington, DC. I'm Michael David, and I will be your host for today's broadcast, which we are proudly co-producing with the Science History Institute and Chemical and Engineering News. From revolutionizing transportation to energy storage, hydrogen has long held promise to replacing traditional fossil fuels in various applications. Today, Vijay Kapoor, the retired CEO of International Solar Electric Technology, will cover the energy content of hydrogen compared to natural gas, its cost comparison with fossil fuels, and the role of hydrogen for energy storage, as well as some safety issues concerning the use of hydrogen in these various applications. And now I'm pleased to turn the time over to Lisa A. Grissom, who is the Senior Philanthropy Advisor at the Science History Institute, to give us more info about today's speaker and moderator as well. Thank you, Mike. Welcome to the Science History Institute in Philadelphia and to our Joseph Priestley Society program series. We are delighted to be co-producing with the ACS webinars. It is my pleasure today to introduce our program leaders. Dr. Vijay Kapoor will be our speaker. Vijay is the retired CEO of International Solar Electric Technology, ICIT, which operated in Los Angeles for 27 years, developing and patenting low-cost photovoltaic technologies as alternatives to silicon solar cells. Dr. Kapoor and his team developed a cost-effective technology for manufacturing thin film CIGS solar cells using printing or spraying techniques. For these activities, Dr. Kapoor secured multiple contracts from the Department of Energy, Department of Defense, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization, and the state of California. ICIT concepts and accomplishments influenced other solar companies worldwide. Prior to starting ICIT, Dr. Kapoor was the Director of Applied Research at Arco Solar in Los Angeles, and before coming to the U.S., Dr. Kapoor worked as a scientific officer at the Baba Atomic Research Center in Mumbai, India, researching new methods to fix radioactive waste in solid media. Dr. Kapoor received his PhD in physical inorganic chemistry from the University of Pennsylvania and executive MBA from the University of California, Los Angeles. We will be taking questions at the end of the presentation and the Q&A will be conducted by Dr. Bill Tzinski. Bill is a partner at the UNAMI Group, LLC. He started his career at Penwalt Corporation, now part of Arkema, and later managed the industrial division at Intellex Chemical Company. Bill co-owned Ivanhoe Industries and retired to form the UNAMI Group. He holds a BS in biochemistry from Manhattan College and a PhD in organic chemistry from Cornell University. Bill serves on the executive committee and is the program chair for the Joseph Priestley Society. Now to begin our program, I present Dr. Vijay Kapoor. Vijay. Thank you, Lisa. It is quite an honor to speak in front of this large audience and talk about the power of hydrogen. As you see on the slide, number one is the climate change issue is the real main driver for the hydrogen in the energy transition. Hydrogen actually is going to be, in the near future, uh, quite a, uh, an active uh, medium to change the entire uh, energy system all over the world. One well, the main reason for that is that the global warming is becoming a serious issue and number of countries that you will see later on are beginning to realize that it is a very serious matter and they need to take some actions on it. Some of you probably know that there is a, a whole lot of large corporations all over the world are getting very conscious of what's called ESG, environmental sustainability governance. And they are also looking into various ways of getting involved with the environmentally sound technologies. Now, if you want to actually keep the climate under control, meaning less than two degrees centigrade warming, then you have on this uh, screen the uh, goals that by 2030, the carbon emission should decline by 25%, and by 2070, it should become uh, almost nil. But if we want to be in the aggressive mode, that means keep the global warming less than 1.5 degrees centigrade, then we wanna have the carbon emission decline 
by 45 percent by 2030 and net zero by 20 and by 2050. Energy-related carbon dioxide emission amount to two-thirds of global greenhouse emission. I mean, energy in general, whether it's transportation, whether it is uh, producing uh, power or heating the buildings or industrial usage, you will see later on the slide. And this is the major concern. But this transition is going to uh, be a little challenging, but nonetheless, hydrogen does offer all the benefits for the economy. If you look at the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere, historically, up until the time when we the, the population started the uh, industrial revolution, the average concentration of carbon dioxide was around 250, 253 ppm. But after the industrial revolution, it boost, I mean, it really increased significantly. And I, on the slide, you see that in October 2020, the level was 411 ppm. But in the recent uh, news that I have seen that the level has gone up to 415 ppm. Now, the net effects of all of this is that there are some extreme weather uh, events that are taking place. People think of warming as global warming, but then you see it actually is disruption of the, of the climate in such a way that some parts get to be too hot and other parts get to be overly cold. And then you have uh, flooding in certain areas that never seen. And then you also seen the melting of glaciers, which causes a serious problem for the availability of clean potable water. Sea level is rising. And quite a number of island countries are really facing a challenge of extinction. And that will create a sizable number of climate refugees. So if you look at the, as the slide shows, the cumulative <clears throat> amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is over 3,200 billion metric tons. And we keep uh, adding every year roughly around 40 billion metric tons. And if you look at the di different contributors, on the left side, you see the pie chart and the, the combination of electricity and heat production, plus the transportation almost accounts for 40% of the total contribution. There are some agriculture activities, whether it's the fertilizer making or we are, getting rid of a lot of greenery, which actually does the fixation of carbon dioxide. That coupled with the industry that uses uh, all kinds of ke uh, chemicals add to uh, the carbon dioxide. And of course we do have uh, um, other minor uh, um, contributors like uh, the building heating and, and the energy issue. But if you look at the right side, the, the pie chart there shows the transportation distribution. And majority of the transportation is tied up with the light and uh, light duty vehicles, which includes the uh, passenger uh, passenger cars and what have you. Of course, there are aircrafts, rails and ships and boats, but it does um, make a significant contribution to the carbon dioxide. Moving on. So what are the urgent actions that we need to take the at least correct the climate change or, or stop it from further degradation? And the number one is a curtail uh, local emission of greenhouse gases and establish systems for carbon dioxide sequestration. The reason I say carbon dioxide sequestration because carbon dioxide is a very stable uh, compound, uh, molecule. Those of you who are chemists already know that it's a very stable molecule and it can stay there in the atmosphere for a very long time, perhaps even hundreds of years. <coughs> so we have to figure out, in fact, some countries are already beginning to look at the carbon capture or carbon sequestration ways. And in the same time, we have to minimize the use of the fossil fuels because most of the carbon dioxide comes from the use of fossil fuels. And as I said, and 
I'll talk briefly how forestry adds to this. It replenishes the lost greenery by planting trees. And we should really look into sustainable agriculture and promote vertical farming and pay a lot of attention to the public transportation. As I pointed out in the previous slide, the transportation is also a big contributor for the greenhouse gases. Hydrogen is the simplest of also the most abundant element in the universe. Stars such as sun consist of mostly of hydrogen. Uh, the sun's energy is a, is a fusion of hydrogen isotopes, and it's a ball of hydrogen and helium gases. Hydrogen occurs naturally on Earth, but not as a free hydrogen gas, but it occurs only in compounds with other elements, in the, either in the form of liquid gases or solids. Hydrogen combined with oxygen is water, as we all know, and when it's combined with carbon, it is all kinds of hydrocarbons found in natural gas, coal, and petroleum. Hydrogen actually is a quite a unique uh, element in the sense that it acts as a uh, carrier of energy. It is produced by some form of uh, energetic activity from some other substances, but then it can be subsequently used to provide energy. Hydrogen can be produced and separated from a variety of sources, including water, fossil fuel, biomass, and used as a source of energy and fuel. <clears throat> what is very interesting, though hydrogen is the, the simplest uh, element, but on weight basis, it has the highest energy content. It's about three times more than gasoline if you talk about weight, not the volumetric. And of course, from the volumetric sense, when it is just a hydrogen in the form of gas, it, it is not as uh, energy uh, dense as it is in the form of liquid or solid. Hydro hydrogen is a versatile in terms of supply and use. It's a free energy carrier that can be produced by many energy sources, including renewables. And I'll touch upon renewables quite a bit. Okay, let's just quickly look at the properties of hydrogen. The first element in the periodic table on Earth, as we already said, is found only as a compound. In, in compounds, it's colorless, odorless, and non toxic gas under normal temperature and pressure conditions. If you were to be liquefied, you really have to chill it down to 200. 53 degrees, minus 253 degrees centigrade. Hydrogen has the highest energy density, uh, but it's the lowest volume density. Highly effective reducing agent is used in uh, metal industry and a number of other industries to as a feedstock. And it is the most abundant element in the entire universe. When you look at the mass fraction of hydrogen, 739,000 ppm, which amounts to around 75% of the normal mass. Here again is a very quick comparison. If you look on the, the slide on the left-hand side, it just shows that uh, per gram, hydrogen has the highest content of energy, 34 kilocalories, compared with wood, petroleum, oil, coal, and Paraffins, hydrogen has the highest content. Again, the same thing is represented in the slide on the right hand side. Both the gravimetric and the uh, volumetric density is shown. And the gravimetric uh, density is very high, as you can see on the right hand corner on the bottom. And pictorially, if you look at hydrogen, it is three times more. Uh, in terms of energy content compared to gasoline, diesel, and natural gas. The, the blue bar is hydrogen compared with gasoline and diesel. It's about three times the content that those uh, fossil fuels have. Okay, so the reason behind the growth of the hydrogen economy, the World Economic Forum in 2017 launched, launched this concept of hydrogen economy. The idea was to really promote the use of fuel cell-based electric vehicles 
both for the private vehicles and for the long distance commercial transport. Renewable energy produced by uh, produced hydrogen can, hydrogen produced by renewable energy can replace the dirty hydrogen that is produced from the fossil fuels in industrial processes and can supplement gas for heating. Hydrogen is being heralded as a solution to many issues faced by our transitioning global energy, particularly when produced by renewable energy, including the intermittency, the risk for renewables. You probably know that sun and wind, though they are becoming already very cost effective, but they are intermittent. So hydrogen can be used to store the energy during the time when they're producing excess energy and then use it later on. It will be the, the agent for reducing the emissions <coughs> in transport in the transport sector by the use of uh, fossil uh, fuel cell uh, run electric vehicles. And thus it becomes the major decarbonization uh, agent for manufacturing sector once we substitute um, the coal and the existing natural gas. Here's a, an overall picture of hydrogen production and also how it can be used. On the left-hand side, you see hydrogen is being produced by renewables. Also, the excess energy in nuclear reactors can be used to produce hydrogen. It's produced from fossil fuels. But then on the right-hand side, you see hydrogen is being uh, as a fuel for heating. Um, it is also used for metal refining and uh, very big component for making ammonia, which is used in the fertilizer. Also used for the upgrading oil and biomass, synthetic fuels, and of, of course, definitely hydrogen vehicle are coming on, on, uh, on the market very quickly, charged by the fuel cells. <laughs> so as an en energy carrier, you produce hydrogen from a renewable sources, and then it is uh, stored in some uh, convenient mode of uh, storage and then used for ultimate use, uh, whether it is for industry, whether it is for vehicles, or whether it is for uh, heating purposes. Moving on, which of the following methods are following are the methods of production hydrogen? You can let us know what your response is and actually can select as many of these as you have. All right, and it looks like 76% said from fossil fuels, 87% said from electrolysis of water, photochemical and photoelectrochemical got 63%, direct thermal decomposition of water got 46%, and trash to hydrogen got 44%. And those are all actually correct answers, but for today's broadcast, we're going to be focusing on the first two. And with that, I will turn it back over to you, BJ. So as we discuss the various approaches for produ producing hydrogen, hydrogen from fossil fuel, hydrogen by electrolysis of water, photochemical production of hydrogen, photoelectrochemical, photoelectrochemical one uses semiconductors that have to absorb the sunlight. So it has to depend on the band gap of the semiconductor, biological and biochemical methods and direct thermal decomposition of water and the super green hydrogen it is called because it's a trash by way of processing in plasma that produces hydrogen, but they collect the carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide separately. However, in this presentation, we're gonna cover the first two topics. Hydrogen from fossil fuel, why? Because that's the current practice that's being used uh, all over the world to produce hydrogen and hydrogen by electrolysis has the potential to be the cheapest way of producing clean hydrogen. And I will begin to talk about the different kind of a uh, color nominee, uh, uh, title that the hydrogen gets. And let's move on to that. Again, this is a summary of the overall picture. You see on the left, the yellow bands, uh, solar and wind are the renewable sources of producing hydrogen algae from and sunlight is the biochemical and biomass 
and then the bottom three are all fossil fuels. And it is only the the at this point the hydrogen produced by the electrolysis is the clean and green hydrogen. We'll, we'll see that now. Again, uh, going over the fact that the current production of hydrogen is better than 95% from fossil fuels. You can see that in this pie chart. It's a, it's a, the renewable section is only a very small green section, <clears throat> but it, as the time goes on, it, with the further development, we will see the, the renewable uh, energy will play a significant role in the hydrogen production. This again is a, a, a way of looking at the hydrogen produced by uh, from the fuel uh, fossil fuels. It produces carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, uh, but the green hydrogen, which is produced by electrolysis, does not create any uh, any carbon dioxide. But this is an old slide. It, it shows the uh, the um, cost of uh, green hydrogen being very high. However, as you go along, we'll see that the, actually there are ways that it, that cost is going to come down very significantly, primarily for the fact that the solar and wind energy costs actually as it stands today, solar produced electricity is the cheapest of all the ways of producing electricity. And we'll talk about that a little more. Okay, now hydrogen from fossil fuel, uh, there are two terminologies called steam methane reforming. That's the first reaction where the, like the natural gas, uh, which consists of a significant amount of methane. It is made to react with water. It produces carbon monoxide and hydrogen. That requires higher temperature, temperature between 700 to 1000 degrees centigrade. And then the subsequent carbon monoxide is made to react in the water shift um, program uh, reaction to produce more hydrogen. So this is the overall basic approach of producing hydrogen from fossil fuels. Now what you see here is uh, the one where you have um, just a pure natural gas, there is some carbon dioxide, but if you wanna capture the carbon dioxide and capture carbon dioxide for subsequent use, then the, that, that gas is considered blue gas. The, the one that is coming straight from the um, fossil fuel is and coal or natural gas and releases carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That is considered the brown gas. And if you look at the hydrolysis, I mean, uh, electrolysis, there are a number of different approaches of electrolysis, alkaline uh, electrolyte and uh, proton exchange uh, membranes. And all these approaches, <clears throat> as you can see from the, the slight equations of anodes and, and cathode, there's no carbon dioxide. So that hydrogen produced is actually green hydrogen. And it is called green and clean hydrogen. You might have seen a lot of news about the green hydrogen. This is what the green hydrogen is it's produced by electrolysis. Now, if you look at the <clears throat> cost of global, uh, local, uh, LCOE stand for levelized uh, cost of energy. And if you look at the comparison here, that <clears throat> hydrogen produced by wind, solar, natural gas, geothermal, wind offshore, that is wind onshore, coal, nuclear, and natural gas. Look at that. I mean, the, it is the wind onshore and solar at this moment are already the cheapest ways of producing. You know, 46, uh, uh, it's, uh, I, I think it's dollars per megawatt hour. And solar is $51 per megawatt hour, but look at that, the rest of the stuff is still very expensive. So, uh, what is happening is there's a lot of attention is being paid to 
the renewable sources of energy to produce hydrogen. And there is some further developments going on. And as a result, you will see that these numbers will further drop down and they will continually be lowered. And that way they will become the main approach for producing hydrogen. <laughs> Just to make that point again, the cost of solar and wind power generation makes uh, by for making hydrogen uh, for, via electrolysis. If you look at that, look at the uh, the the this yellow line is the PV uh, flat plate uh, photovoltaic, and then this slightly brownish yellow is is concentrated PV. And the, the, the gray line is the onshore wind and blue line is the offshore wind. But as you can see, in the last 10 years, from 2010 to 2020, all of these costs have come down significantly, both wind in photovoltaics, whether the wind onshore or wind offshore, photovoltaics flat panel or concentrated. We see a significant drop from uh, from 2010 onward and this drop is continuing further and it will go even further with the new developments that are taking place here is an example again they look at the i want to point out the thing this uh, brown line is for photovoltaic look at that from 2009 to 2019 what a drop it's down to $40 per megawatt hour. It used to be around $360 per megawatt hour. Same thing about the wind. This is onshore wind from 135 down to 43. Now this trend will continue and it is likely to bring this cost down to a level that will begin to really challenge the production of hydrogen from fossil fuels. So that's a, <coughs> excuse me. So you see in the electrolysis area, that's how the renewable energy will be used to produce hydrogen. There are a number of issues. One is the CapEx, the equipment cost for the capital equipment that you're gonna buy for the electrolyzer. Operating cost and then the cost of electricity. Now this chart is somewhat old. It is showing that it's uh, uh, in around 2040, 2050, the uh, cost of production of hydrogen per you know, US dollars per kilogram will be down to $1.38. And this brown band here, horizontal band, is the cost of uh, producing hydrogen from the fossil fuels. I believe this thing is already beginning to happen. We are far away from 40, it's beginning to happen in India and in China. They, I saw some reports that the cost of production of uh, uh, the, the solar electricity and wind uh, generated electricity is much lower. So this is the trend and that's when the hydrogen will become a key player. Now let's look at the existing and emerging demand for hydrogen. Uh, the top blue band here is the existing growing demand, material handling equipment, but this in the transportation, buses and light duty vehicles, chemical and industrial application, oil refining, ammonia and methanol, stationary power generation, distributed uh, generation, primary and backup power. And actually it is being also looked at some major fields that there can be integrating with the existing grid. And the emerging uh, demands are gonna be definitely in transportation, the medium and heavy duty vehicles that be run by fuel cells. Actually, it turns out some of the countries in Europe are already using uh, uh, fuel cell hydrogen for light rails for mass transportation. It will be also in maritime. Actually, what is interesting, I came across some news from Airbus. 
Airbus is already experimenting with planes flying with the uh, fossil, I mean, fuel cell hydrogen. And so I, some of you who are you know, quite familiar with the chemistry of cement, cement, cement is considered to be one of the major contributor of the carbon dioxide. So in the future, they will be thinking about using hydrogen for steel and cement manufacturing in addition to others. And of course, the industrial heat will also be carried out by, by hydrogen. Um, again, there you can read this. I mean, stationary uh, power supply. Hydrogen can, we'll, we'll talk about hydrogen can be stored in solid media and it can be uh, used on a stationary application. And of course, it's also getting into the hydrogen for integrating the power generation with the grid. Let's see. Okay. Here is the storage for hydrogen. The physical methods are, of course, compressed gas, cold cryo um, compressed, and then liquid hydrogen. Although there are some recent studies going on there, even trying to figure out how to take hydrogen in the solid phase. And in the material base, there are absorbent. These are um, metallic organic framework liquid organic interstitial hydrides and complex hydrides and chemical hydrogen. Chemical hydrogen is in, in ammonia. Now, those of you who are familiar with particularly the, uh, the uh, hybrid cars coming out of, uh, I remember I bought a car in uh, Prius in more than 11 years ago. That was running on nickel hydride batteries and it still is running. And so there is a lot of promise how hydrogen can play a significant role in a variety of different applications. Now, let's just briefly go into the fuel cell. <clears throat> fuel cell is just a uh, providing hydrogen as a fuel and using air as a source of oxygen. Here is a schematic of a hydrogen fuel cell from Airbus. Remember I mentioned the Airbus, a big plane uh, manufacturing in Europe. And these are basically the, the equations. And this is the schematic of the fuel cell. Now, what is very interesting though, the, the electrical efficiency of the fuel cells, uh, you might see here the different <laughs> ranges anywhere from the lower end from 35% uh, to almost 60%. At com that compares with the internal combustion engine, which run typically on the higher end between 25 to 30%. And these efficiencies are likely to go up. In fact, some reports that I have seen are talking about this efficiency going up to 80%. So fuel cell technology, and hydrogen, plus hydrogen will be the key player. Here are the examples of the uh, buses and big trucks. And of course, this is the Toyota's most recent uh, hydrogen run, uh, hydrogen fuel cell run car, Mirai, that was just 2020. And uh, I do not know, maybe some of you have heard the news that GM, the major uh, auto manufacturer in the U.S. announced that by 2030, they will stop producing cars or vehicles that run on gasoline. This is a pack of fuel cell that GM is going to supply to a trucking company. Okay, now, as an energy source, the question comes up, well, how long will it take me to fuel my hydrogen uh, fuel cell car. And here's an example of how much energy it carries. And as I pointed out, in this liquid and solid phase, it has a very high density compared to gasoline, diesel, ethanol. And uh, it doesn't take a very long time to pump. It's, it's very comparable. Charging the, or filling your gas tank, it's 
same thing is filling with the hydrogen for the fuel cell. Here's the example. They are looking at some. Uh, th this is a yacht that is run entirely by hydrogen. This is an example of a, a home system that can carry 40 kilowatt hours of energy that can run a house, complete house, at least two days. But it has its own built in electrolyzer, and these red things are solid uh, uh, hydrogen storage packages. Now, the question comes up well, how safe is hydrogen? Surprisingly, hydrogen, I mean, I, in my own career, use hydrogen a lot in, in our processing. And you have to be careful, but once you are careful, hydrogen is is just as good or as, or as bad as any of the other fuels that you come across. But number one, it's not toxic, and it is benign to the environment. Uh, and we already talked about it. it has a lot more energy, and it's no danger than the other fuels that store chemical energy. And the other interesting thing is that hydrogen, of course, being a light element, has a very high buoyancy. So if at all, if it comes out somewhere, it very quickly disperses in the in the atmosphere. However, you have to be, and, and then sometimes people think, oh, well, hydrogen bomb. Hydrogen bomb is not made out of ordinary hydrogen. The ordinary hydrogen is, is called protium, the, uh, the hydrogen, uh, isotope. It is the tritium and that is the one that's used for the the fusion of the nuclear reactors. But it is the caution here is that it must be used pretty carefully. Make sure that it doesn't mix up with the uh, air and oxygen. There is a wide range of flammability of hydrogen if ox air mixes up with this. And uh, the Toyota guys did some testing of the new uh, fuel cell powered uh, hydrogen fuel cell powered cars and did the crash testing and they found out that they, there was no problem and they actually talked about that in Mirai tank is safer than the conventional fuel tank. Okay so the key developments as we talk here are the number one the cost of hydrogen supply coming from the renewable sources has come down significantly and it is coming, it's gonna go down even further. And the other how other issue is that it has no greenhouse uh, greenhouse emission, and people are now concerned all over the world how to mitigate the uh, the carbon and uh, the greenhouse emission. So these are the key fact developments in the hydrogen economy that are going to go play a key role. And as a result, you see a number of countries are now being very active in pushing the hydrogen economy, hydrogen as a fuel to be used. So we wanted to ask you which of uh the countries is currently the most active in the hydrogen economy. Would that be South Korea, France, the United States, Saudi Arabia, or India? Thirty-three percent of the audience said South Korea, six percent said France, twelve percent said the United States, fifteen percent said Saudi Arabia, and thirty-three percent said India. So it was tied with South Korea. The answer actually is South Korea, although Japan is doing a lot of work to catch up. So as I said, because of these key factors, the overall cost of hydrogen production is coming down and it can be used in the fuel cells, it can be used as a feedstock. A number of countries are taking very, very proactive approach to set up the infrastructure in their countries <laughs> of hydrogen and use of hydrogen. So here are the countries listed that are most active in hydrogen economies, South Korea, Japan, Germany, France, United States, UK, Canada, China, Norway, Denmark, Australia, Switzerland, Saudi Arabia, and India. But what is really interesting is that 
in fact, in Japan, they are basically talking about completely switching over to hydrogen economy. In the US, uh, I know the state of California is very, very uh, active in that area, but it'll take some time. The main key issue is, is the, the cost. And then of course there's the politics because we in this country have a lot of uh, locations where we are the suppliers or source of uh, fossil fuels. The state of California, Pennsylvania uses a lot of fracking. And uh, so there is a lobby from those people to go against that. But I think once the cost factors are brought under control and it is demonstrated that it works a really cost effective way, then there is a possibility that even the powerful lobbyists of the fossil fuel will think differently. And the example in that, as, a, as I'll show you some uh, highlights, I mean, uh, headlines, the countries like you know Dubai and the UAE area and Saudi Arabia, of course, Saudi Arabia also, you may or may not know, uses a lot of solar to desalinate, a lot of uh, energy to do desalinate water because they don't have as much water. So they take water from the ocean and desalinate. But they are also thinking very seriously going into renewable energy. But there is a, till the time the fossil fuel production is completely phased out, there's a market for these uh, fossil fuel rich countries. And they are talking about producing hydrogen exporting to the countries that are not able to produce hydrogen large quantity. So here are some of the high, um, headlines. Oil rich Abu Dhabi is targeting hydrogen future for export fuel. The uh, Chinese Sinopac is really getting very active. China and uh, is is trying to be the leading player in the clean energy. Saxony area is, is uh, moving forward for the hydrogen train. And I, it's really interesting. I was quite amazed when I found out that in, in Netherlands, in Germany, in Austria, they are running light trains that run entirely on the fossil, um, I mean, fuel cell, hydrogen fuel cells. And uh, here is Toshiba is accelerating the fuel cell development. And interestingly enough, now Russia is also trying to be a leader in this hydrogen tech. Siemens Energy is thinking of uh, earning a billion dollars in hydrogen. So there are quite a few uh, interesting uh, uh, headlines that really basically uh, endorse the fact that this is coming. This is something that's going to come in the very near future, perhaps faster than, than most of the people think. Just wanted to make a quick point of uh, the symbol for the Science History Institute is John Dalton's representation of a hydrogen atom. So we've, we've come full circle here. A lot of interesting questions, VJ, some of which you answered during the talk, but one question that stood out was, what role will ammonia play in this in the future and how will this impact fertilizer? Ammonia is, as we well know, is used for the fertilizer industry and hydrogen is used to produce ammonia by the Haber process. It's also ammonia is used as a medium of transporting hydrogen, but which is kind of a little <coughs> expensive way of doing it because you first use Haber process using hydrogen to produce ammonia, and then ammonia can be transported easily. It is done quite a bit, and then you, there are now developments going on how to extract hydrogen in a cost-effective way back from from ammonia. So ammonia will be there for quite some time to come. Well, there were a number of questions related to transportation. One was comment that hydrogen seemed to be making headway in cars 15 years ago. Why did this stall? Well, I think 15 years ago, probably it was not really cost effective as gasoline was cheap enough. But now the concern with the greenhouse gas emission and simultaneously the overall cost of 
producing hydrogen and the fuel cells, hydrogen fuel cell coming down is making it more attractive. And you know, it's a Toyota is now very active and the, even Mercedes is coming out with the cars that will run on fuel cells. And I, I mentioned that GM is saying that they're gonna completely phase out the gasoline powered vehicles. Well, with respect to transportation, there were a number of, and not just transportation, but there were a number of questions with respect to transportation or how best to safely, effectively, cost-effectively move hydrogen from the point of generation to consumption, including uh, building stations for automobiles and building that infrastructure. There is going to be challenges on the infrastructure for supplying uh, hydrogen for the fuel cells. I think when I was living in LA, Honda had some uh, hydrogen fueling stations for the, at that time, introduced car called Clarity, which was a uh, hydrogen fuel cell. But I, as the cost become a lot more attractive, we will see the infrastructure will be built. And uh, I, I have no doubt that it will catch on and it'll be cost effective. Okay, another question was, I'm in an area that is uh, has an arid climate. Is it still feasible to, to produce hydrogen from water electrolysis under those conditions? Well, question will be, what will be the source of water in, in say like in desert area somewhere? Frankly speaking, I, I think there is something very interesting. If you carefully look at, besides the ocean, how do we get water on this planet Earth? The water comes from what is called the terminology air well. That means the, the atmosphere that is moving above us is carrying trillions of gallons of water. It either comes down as snow or comes down as rain. So there are actually technologies using uh, uh, solar, uh, particularly, that you can extract water out of the air. So I think um, I'm, this is my just a projection. I think the chances are that those kinds of technologies will also move forward, that you can extract a, a water out of air and use it for hydrogen production. Chemical question, hydrogen can be decomposed by positing palladium on a copper surface. How does this compare with photochemical in terms of cost and feasibility? Well, I think palladium catalysts have been used in the past, but now a number of research groups are developing concepts of uh, nano uh, particle catalysts that will allow uh, with the sunlight or photo, I mean, photoelectrochemistry is a question of using some semiconductors, but there are photochemical techniques which are using some nanoparticle materials and along with sunlight and produce hydrogen. Also, in what aspects can organic chemistry contribute to this in developing this technology? Well, I am not an organ, but I think uh, what is interesting if in one of my slides I was pointing out the hydrogen in stored in chemical uh, materials, and there was a organometallic framework. So perhaps uh, some of the smart organic chemists can figure out a clever way of making this metal organic uh, framework in which hydrogen can be stored, and they can make the contribution there. What technical breakthroughs are needed to bring the cost of hydrogen per unit, per energy unit, down to the cost of natural gas? As I pointed out in that slide, uh, where we talk about the capex of the electrolyzer and the cost of energy, <clears throat> I think uh, if you look at the thermodynamic value of breaking high, uh, water for hydrogen and oxygen, uh, it is much lower than what actually is practiced. And that is the, in the process of electrolysis, you have over potential built up 
which gets the sum of the electrodes polarized and it uses more electricity. Now, there are a number of research groups that are working on to modify those electrodes so that the over potential is lowered. And then in that, is also when you have high over potential, you are actually producing a lot of heat. And there is a concern about coming up with electrodes such that it's uh, over potential is lowered and the, there's a lot of energy is not wasted as heat. And that result will result in lowering the cost of uh, electrolyzer and the cost of electricity. I'm already pointing out it's coming down very significantly. So that way, the combination of these two, the improvement <coughs> of electrolyzers and the overall cost of lowering of uh, uh, renewable energy will make it very cost effective. You showed um, a system of hydrogen for renewable for residential use. It can you comment about the long-term prospects for that? Can it be blended with natural gas? Uh, well, I, in that, part, I mean, that's a device that I came across that somebody's producing. Actually, it has a built-in electrolyzer in it. And uh, what you can do by just putting the proper kind of a electrolyte in there, you can produce hydrogen <laughs> and then store it. But you can also use hydrogen for heating the homes. Now, uh, just on a side note, I came across a a, a a yacht company that actually, it's a catamaran. That catamaran had its solar panels on it, and it also had windmills on it. And it was going in the ocean, and it will take water from the ocean. and produce hydrogen with that energy, uh, both solar and wind, and store hydrogen for its propulsion. And so there are a lot, I think there's a lot of room for innovation and uh, creating new approaches in a cost-effective way. I think the bottom line is to show the world that it is cost-effective and it can be done in a safe way. And then we'll see the big transition taking place. I think most that covers most of the questions here's one that is there a future for hydrogen combustion engines so direct combustion of hydrogen rather than going through a fuel cell i see uh, there are some companies that are looking into it and uh, i think there will probably somewhere we'll come across that there are ICE units being used internal combustion engines being used for with hydrogen as of right now i think it's still in the development stage okay well i think that covers the questions that we had um appreciate everyone asking such thoughtful questions so we'll turn it back to you for some final thoughts vj i what i'd like to summarize is saying that the access to renewable both solar and wind electricity has made the cost of production of green and clean hydrogen by electrolysis competitive with hydrogen from fossil fuels. It will keep on further improving and will go down if the cost will be reduced further. Technologies for hydrogen storage have established, have been established. Hydrogen as an energy carrier that offers flexibility and portability. High efficiency of power generation of by fuel cells. From conveniently stored Cost-effective hydrogen has offered zero emission fuel for the transportation sector for the global economy. Green and cleanly produced hydrogen used as a feedstock for steel, cement, fertilizer, and chemicals will help curtail greenhouse gas emissions. Long-term energy storage with hydrogen provides a solution for a capture of intermittency of power from, you know, as you all know, both solar and wind have intermittent power generation because sun when the sun is shining it gets uh, power produced but in the night time what do you do but then if you have excess energy being generated during that time you can store that in hydrogen and then hydrogen fuel cells can be used up as a backup power both for the standalone and the grid connected integration the combined effect of these issues is to establish a clear approach to adopt the hydrogen economy, minimize the use of fossil fuels, and stop further degradation of climate change.
Thank you for watching this presentation. ACS Webinars is provided as a service by the American Chemical Society as your professional source for live weekly discussions and presentations that connect you with subject matter experts and global thought leaders concerning today's relevant professional issues in the chemical sciences, management, and business.